I'm Mark Hennick. This is So-Called Normal. Hey folks, welcome to So-Called Normal. Today is World Mental Health Day, so we have a very special guest for you today uh, on a very special day. Here is the very special Steve Lurie. Uh, Steve is the executive director of CMHA Toronto, the Toronto branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association. That's a position that he's had since 1979, making him pretty much one of the grandfathers of the modern mental health movement in Canada. So he's a perfect guest for World Mental Health Day, because uh, if you're not directly involved with the mental health care system in, in Canada, Canada, you might have never heard his name, uh, but if you are, then you'll almost certainly know who Steve Lurie is, because he's been involved in almost every aspect of, of the system. Uh, in 2016, he was given he was appointed as a member of the Order of Canada, recognizing his, his leading contributions to this space for so long. Um, so it, it was a real privilege for me to talk to them, because more than just being a, one of the, the top leaders in this field, and one of the top change makers in this field for so long, uh, Steve has also become uh, a great mentor to me. I mean, he gave me my first job in in uh, in frontline mental health care when I when I first moved to Toronto. Uh, he's been a recurring source of endless information, uh, and I think that shines through so well in the conversation that that we had together. So um, I hope that you enjoy it, that you share it for sure. Uh, the conversation that I have with Steve Laurie, uh, executive director of CMHA Toronto on So Called Normal. Well, I'm a, a guy who, one of the few people who was born and raised and still lives in Toronto. Yes. Um, and, you know, I grew up uh, in a relatively privileged environment. I, I grew up in Forest Hill. I went to the school system. And actually, the village of Forest Hill was founded around an education system. So I was fortunate mm. that I had, you know, a, a pretty good public education system, uh, you know, uh, experience when... Um, uh, and, 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 and as a young guy, I was sort of interested in politics, and I still remember uh, take, we'd, in grade four, we'd learned how to take notes, you right. know. And I remember watching the Kennedy-Nixon debates and taking notes on who was saying oh, what. Oh, interesting, yeah. And so I have a sense that my interest in history and my interest in politics sort of fueled uh, my career. I did a degree in political science, and then... Um, much to my surprise, I, I hoped to, to uh, study environmental law at UBC so I could ski. Uh, and uh, <laughs> they decided that uh, there were too many people from the East applying to law school and said, um, well, you, uh, you lost your chance. There, we're, we're, not, we're giving priority to Westerners and not right. Easterners. And I had already turned down a couple of the law schools in Toronto and also the School of Social Work. And I had thought, you know, maybe I'll re reapply uh, to the School of Social Work, basically phone them and say, I made a mistake, would you take me? Uh, because I had signed up for community development and social administration, and I thought that was, you know, similar to, uh, you know, a political science sociology angle. Right. Uh, so I threw myself on their mercies, and after a couple of interviews, they they started me, in, you know, in 1971, and I, I did an MSW in... Um, uh, community development and social administration, as I said. And then I, I got my first real job with the Ontario Welfare Council uh, as their uh, planner for all the social planning councils in, uh, in Ontario. And after about two years, I lost that job because I wrote a satire on government. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, well, okay. So you tell me a bit more about the satire on government. So, so the, in those days, the Committee on Social Planning Councils was trying to get the government to fund them. Okay. So this was the uh, mid-70s. And uh, the Honorable Margaret Birch had published a white paper on uh, whether the government should fund social planning councils, because a lot of them were either funded by United Way, uh, only two were funded by municipalities. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what did, what did sorry, these councils do? So they basically had a community development function. There's still one in Toronto, the CSPC, the Community Social Planning Council of Toronto, and they would take on issues like child care, housing, mm -hmm. poverty, and they'd bring the social services together. In places like, like Windsor and London, uh, it, they were an arm of the United Way. And okay. so it was a way of looking at community needs. 
And the, the feeling was that as important as physical planning was, social planning was also really important, sure. and government should uh, see it as a priority. And so, did that include mental health services at that time? Well, it was the early days, and right. there really wasn't much discussion about mental health. Right. So, um, so it was interesting that uh, I wrote this satire. Uh, the government put out a uh, a green paper on you know their options around funding, and I did a sort of an editorial in a newsletter that uh, I wrote that my uh, f- former boss had approved, uh, saying this was a bit like a grim fairy tale, and wrote it right. up that way. <laughs> uh, and he had approved it. It went out. And then a few people raised some concerns about it, and about a, you know a week later, he said, "You know, uh, I think we're going to end your job." Uh, so my <laughs> job diplomatic. was done. Um, but luckily, one of my social planning colleagues, Bo- Roberta Adamson, uh, who was the uh, executive director of the Social Planning Council in Oshawa, Whitby, said, "You know, Steve, there's a job here, and they need somebody with community development because CMHA Durham had just come through." Uh, a divestment of their White Cross Center, which was an early version of a drop-in. Mm. Uh, the, they were in a bit of disarray, uh, and they were looking for a role. I said, you know, there's a job there. Why don't you apply? Mm. So I, you know, submitted my resume. Uh, I apparently got an interview because the board chair at the time liked my signature. Uh, <laughs> and the rest is history. So is that a- was that was 1975, you know. So, uh, you know, this I'm, is fascinating, both in terms of the uh, firing and the, the hiring at the new job, that none of it has anything to do with your qualifications, it seems. <laughs> it seems to be all politics and all well, relationships. I, well, I think actually, to some degree, the the hiring in Durham was they sure. were looking for somebody who had community development. Expertise. Sure, the eventual yeah, hire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what got you yeah. noticed? I but you're right. I mean, it was all about, I mean, it, I, w- I was enjoying my job at the Ontario Welfare Council. Right. I, I, I wasn't sure that it would last forever. But mm. a- And the interesting thing is that the, the Durham job uh, was came at a really interesting time because it was the beginning of community mental health right. in, in Ontario. The o- CMHA Ontario Division had held a legislative breakfast okay. in 1976 where they invited MPPs from all parties. And they basically said, you know, you've got all these people who are returning to the community from the psychiatric hospitals and there's no community capacity. And the government responded and they started with a $5 million grant for community mental health. And today we're spending $1.7 billion. So this is early 60s, uh, or, or sorry, late 60s into the early and mid 70s. You're uh, studying to become a social worker. You have an interest in sociology. Is it a far leap to say that you were a bit of a hippie at the time? Well, I mean, I did have hair down to my shoulders. You did. Okay, uh, so the answer is yes. And I was, a, a, and I was, and still am a musician. I mean, I played drums, right, or rock right. and roll. You know. Did you play hacky sack? Did you play hacky sack in college? No, no, no. I wasn't coordinated enough. <laughs> So, but this is also, you raised, the time of deinstitutionalization, right, not just right. in, in Toronto and Ontario, but around the world in many respects. So yes. um, what was the reputation then? I mean, Toronto had and still has one of the biggest uh, psychiatric hospitals in the world. Was was the then version of CAMH, uh, the cool. Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, open in Toronto? Yeah. There, well, there the were, Toronto it, Lunatic it, Asylum, well, I think it, it was called? It, well, it, it, it had evolved. There was the Queen Street Mental Health Centre right. and the Clark Institute. Right. And, you know, 18 general hospital programs because, um, you know, beginning uh, in the, the, the late 40s with the Dominion Mental Health Grants, uh, money had begun to be directed at the development of uh, general hospital psychiatric programs. Okay. Uh, and, and so, but you, you had what uh, Dr. Don Wazalenki called uh, the three-legged stool. Right. Uh, you had... The psychiatric hospitals, which were not well connected to the general hospitals, the general hospital psychiatric units, which ranged from, let's say, 25 to 40 beds, yeah. and very little in the community. Right. So uh, When did that start to shift? Was there a reason or a politician or an event that caused that to start to change? Well, as I said, I think in Ontario, it, it was likely the legislative breakfast right. Uh, right. that where CMHA Ontario... Um, was really pushing, let's do stuff in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, you know, that, that, you know, $5 million of funding, uh, Dr. Pat Lyons, who had been the medical director at uh, Whitby Psychiatric Hospital, Ontario Shores, which also was serving Toronto, Mm -hmm. uh, became the uh, mental health branch director. And he sent out two 
of his staff, Al Erlenbush and Betty Jean McDonald, two years later to review what had they gotten for this $5 million. Mm. And they came back astounded mm. because organizations had set up everything from housing to drop-ins to employment programs. And they realized that, you know, this community mental health stuff would work, right. that, that you could actually um, help people who uh, were coming out of either the general hospitals or the psychiatric hospitals provide, you know, psychosocial supports. And guess what? Right. The, the readmission rate would decline. Right. Yeah. And now this is uh, this is really the heart and soul of CMHA, the Canadian Mental Health Association, in terms of community care. But that organization had already been around for some time uh, by the time of this shift, by the 70s. So it had already been around for 60-ish years. Right? Oh, yes. Well, in fact, I mean, CMHA was, uh, was founded in 1918. Um, and um, actually, Dr. Claire Hinks, who late in life disclosed that he lived with a mental illness, mm -hmm. Um, and he was a psychiatrist? Yeah. 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 Um, he actually started the first community clinic in, uh, in about 1917 here. And mm -hmm. there's a recording of, of Claire talking about they got their patients from everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the courts, the school system. So, I mean, that's the paradox. It's th the issues that we talk about today were still prevalent mm -hmm. even 100 years ago. So CMHA uh, evolved. It had two foci, I guess. Um, uh, Claire Hinks uh, and, and Marjorie Hiscott Keys went across the country looking into the asylums mm -hmm. uh, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And uh, uh, Claire Hinks relates in his memoirs the story of um, visiting the asylum in Brandon where there were 900 people uh, one psychiatrist and ca wire cages Jeez. over the beds. And so CMHA's tradition was advocacy uh, for uh, a better, uh, better mental health services. And in fact, the story is told, Jack Griffin, uh, who, who succeeded Claire, said, uh, told the story that uh, when Claire visited uh, the Brandon Asylum and then he went to Selkirk, and he was so enraged, he came back to Winnipeg on a Sunday night, and in those days CMHA had real clout, mm. uh, he got a meeting with the Premier mm. and the Cabinet and told the story of you know, the depravity that he observed and got, and this was a lot of money in those days, I mean, this was you know, the early 20s, um, he got a $5 million grant and a pledge from the Manitoba government right. to fix the system. Yeah, so that people aren't sleeping in cages and, and wetting themselves and being shackled to exactly. the floor. Yeah. So that work began all across Canada. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and then also in the 20s, CMHA was responsible uh, for some of the early child guidance clinics and sort of a, a health promotion approach. And I remember when I was doing some of the work for Mike Kirby's uh, Out of the Shadows at Last, I actually found an artifact, a, a letter written by Joey Smallwood, mm. uh, saying one of the reasons that uh, um, Newfoundland should join Canada as he could, you could get access to Dominion mental health grants <laughs> from really? the federal government. <laughs> so, you know, but I think, you know, the CMHA history across the country, sure. we, you know, we've promoted uh, the development of um, uh, better services at the community level right. and, and housing and things that make a difference, the social determinants of health, as well as we've talked about what does it take for people to be mentally healthy, right. as you know. Right. Uh, and, you know, uh, certainly in Ontario, the CMHA branches since that 1976 legislative breakfast have become a real powerhouse of multi-service, evidence-based uh, organizations. You know, you can go pretty much to any major city or town in, uh, in Ontario and be assured that there'll be, you know, a good... Um, housing program, that there'll be an assertive community treatment team, there'll be an early psychosis right. program. Well, I mean, not, not to hold your feet too closely to the fire or anything, but assuming people can actually access them and assuming they have capacity to, to take them on, assuming there's awareness, funding, all that stuff. Yeah. It's great to say that it's there, but if people can't actually use it or get to it or know about it, what well, that, it? well, and that's, that's a huge problem. I mean, and I, and I think it's twofold. I mean, you hear a lot about um, you know, the difficulty in navigating the system. Right. Uh, and, and to some degree, that's a, a, a function of the lack of capacity overall, mm -hmm. uh, because in many communities where you don't have a coordinated access system like we do in Toronto, um, 
people will make one phone call and they'll be told, well, no, sorry, that place isn't available. Right. They'll make another one and you can make 30 calls and still get nothing. Right. In Toronto, actually, it's one of the you know, uh, urban myths that there's too many agencies and we don't work together. Uh, the the co- the access point, which has been around for over ten years, is a is a collaborative of fifty one organizations, and there's one number to call, one mm-hmm. application uh, for housing, early psychosis, case management, act teams, withdrawal yeah. management. Now the problem still is capacity. Right. For example, the capacity for supportive housing in Toronto is. Uh, Uh, quite limited. There are 17,000 people on the wait list. We've got about 5,000 people uh, who are able to access supportive housing. So you can see the gap. And, you know, every quarter, there are about 1,400 people added to the wait list. So 10 years ago, that wait list was 700, non-duplicated. Now it's 17,000. Now, is that a population increase issue or more people becoming homeless for other reasons? Why is that increasing? I, I think... Part of it is just the fact that there's a registry, right? Mm. So, so that people that we're counting them, yeah, now, that we're, we're counting, yeah. and that and that people um, uh, basically have identified that either uh, they're uh, homeless or um, they're at risk of homelessness or they're uh, precariously housed, mm. and now people know. Well, there is supportive housing. I mean, when I first started working in Toronto, we had 110 supportive housing beds. Right. Now we've got over 5,000. Now yeah. you could argue we need 25,000. There has been, over 40 years, an increase. And, you know, the supportive housing providers in Toronto really have been doing, like, housing first work, the evidence-based approach to supportive housing for many, many years. And what's, the, what's that, housing? housing so first? that's primarily about um, trying to give people housing first right. and then, and <laughs> well, then th- thank you Steve. <laughs> and, and and then flexing the supports yes, according to yeah. their needs so this idea that uh, if somebody has a, a, a mental illness a particularly a severe and persistent mental illness and they're homeless uh, that if you focus on the housing first uh, yeah. rather than the mental illness first it could actually help in the yeah end. and you know the mental health commission that you were a part of um, funded uh, through uh, the federal government a uh, the the largest uh, evidence-based homelessness intervention trial in the world at Home Chez Soi. And for example, the Toronto site showed that 80% of the clients, regardless of level of need, and in particular for those with high needs, Mm -hmm. were able to sustain their housing. Yeah. Uh, and Assu- assuming, of course, that it was um, available, it, that it was available, but it was also uh, housing first, not housing only. That's uh, right. That the housing came with support. Yeah. So the minimum requirement in, in a housing first program is one meaningful contact a week. And right. sometimes that's a challenge because people get their housing and say, yeah, yeah, I don't need you anymore. Right. But that meaningful contact means that you can flex services up and down. I remember a uh, a story that a colleague of ours who used to work at CMHA and then went to work at the Vancouver site told that it's sort of representative of how this actually should and can work. So there was a, a, a young fellow who had been in the downtown east side homeless in Vancouver and they got him a really nice apartment in North Vancouver overlooking House Sound. Um, and um, the housing worker went to visit him and she'd knock on the door and nobody would answer. Mm. And she realized that there was a chance that this guy actually wasn't even staying in this great new housing. Mm-hmm. So she did some asking around and she said, well, like, wh- where does this guy go? Where's his network? And somebody told her about this particular drop-in in the downtown east side that this guy liked and he went there every Wednesday for sure mm. because he liked their ice cream. <laughs> So there she was on Wednesday. He shows up for his ice cream and she built the relationship and kept, you know, in touch with him. And talk about meeting people where they are. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Yeah, But that's I mean, I think that's a good example about, you know, we we tend to pathologize mental illness as opposed to, you know, focusing on what are people's strengths? What do they like? Yeah. You know, um, Mike Slade, who's who's done uh, a lot of work on the development of a of assessment tools uh, like the OCAN or the Camberwell. But he often argues we need to ask people who they are, what right. they like, what what they're good at. Um, so I remember him talking about, you know, assessments and saying, like, have you ever asked anybody if they play music? 
Mm. Have you ever asked anybody if they like art, if they like photography? Yeah. And that's where I think, you know, some of the programs that we've seen develop, uh, the peer support programs, some of the drop-ins that, you know, have, uh, you know, Park here in Toronto uh, has a, uh, a, a writer's club. There's Inkwell, uh, which is uh, a group of uh, people with lived experience who publish and, yeah. can, you know, and it, again, it says to people, you're not your mental illness. Right. You can well, have a life. And that's I've, I've told this story, these stories before, but that's exactly what saved my life in the process of suicide attempts. It was not somebody asking me what medications I was on or what therapies I had tried because I had, at that point felt like I tried them all. I was a frequent flyer, as we call them by that point, un, you know, unflatteringly. Um, but it was that somebody asking me about what I was interested in and yeah. what, what I like to do, you know, getting to know me uh, that, that helped me the most. So when did that come into the equation in the CMHA context to go back to the CMHA history there you know uh, Clifford Beers and I'm fami- fa- fairly familiar with it myself but uh, is a, a shared founder of sorts with Mental Health America yeah, a similar yeah. a sister organization in the United States so, uh, did he bring the the lived experience uh, angle here or when did that come in and, and how did it flourish well you know there's an interesting story that uh, is told of um, uh, about our founder, uh, Clarence Hinks, visiting Clifford Beards. And uh, so um, he goes down to New York to visit Clifford Beards, who wrote this book that is still available today on the internet, A Mind That Found Itself. And Mm. Beards was an engineer who'd attempted suicide by jumping off a building but survived. And he was, as you said, the founder of the uh, American Association for Mental Hygiene. Uh, Hinks comes down to visit him, and he says to Hinks, have you read my book? Well, <laughs> Hinks is a doctor, you know. He says, I, I, no, I haven't read your book. So Beer says to him, you know, until you read my book, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> uh, now, apparently, I mean, again, this wasn't publicly known until Hinks disclosed it, but uh, Hinks had his own mental health issues and was, you know, often very energized for six to eight months at a time, oh, and then they'd pack him off to Muskoka right. to rejuvenate. For vacation, yeah. quote-unquote. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So he uh, he apparently read the book cover to cover that at his hotel that night in New York, and then began his conversations with beers, which led to this partnership. And at one point, um, Hinks was the uh, uh, secretary of the American Association for Mental Hygiene, as well as the mm. uh, the executive lead for the Canadian uh, Institute for Mental Hygiene. Mm-hmm. But I think in those days, as I said earlier, the focus was on really these horrible asylums. Mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. wasn't about what constitutes good treatment. I think right. that came much, much later. Okay, um, so it's more of the human rights that, yeah, look at, yeah, you know, how could yeah. you see somebody in a cage and not be appalled yeah. by this? But how did it get to that point in, in, to begin with? You know, these are all medical professionals who were involved before Hanks came along, too. Well, you know, I mean, I think some of it has to do with stigmas. A lot of it has to do with exclusion. Um, uh, you know, Foucault's book, Madness and Civilization, is instructive because uh, in that book he talks about uh, the Ship of Fools. Mm. And this was a ship in the four- 13th and 14th century that went along the Rhine River. And the townspeople would take their lame, disabled, and mentally ill and mm. walk them onto the pier. They would walk on, they would then be mm. walked on to the Ship of Fools. The ship would leave the pier, go into the middle of the river, and uh, drown wow. the mentally ill. Wow. So that that was, you know, the, the polar... Uh, focus of exclusion. Yeah. And then, you know, by the by the 17th century, 3% of Paris's population was in the asylums. Right. So we have had a a long history. I remember visiting the uh, the uh, uh, asylum in Williamsburg, Virginia, which was a very prosperous American town. And, you know, the asylum had been founded in the uh, 18th century, and they actually have a diorama there where you go in and the first room is basically a very stark stone walls, shackles, and straw. Mm. And then, you know, by the uh, mid-1800s, they had realized, well, community living is important, and because they were relatively well off as a a community, you see this nice Victorian apartment with a bed sitting room. And then you walk out from there uh, where, similar to Trinity College in Dublin, they've got the minute books displayed in a, in a glass case. Mm. And there's a, a, a letter written to the state legislature. So this is uh, 1869. 
uh, where they said, you know, if you could give us money for housing and employment, we could get a lot of our patients back into the community. <laughs> and there was no response. Really? The yeah. board of trustees of the asylum wrote the same letter in 1879, and there was no response. Yeah. And it really took until the 1960s when, of course, there was, again, a human rights yeah. approach, yeah. Around, and which led to deinstitutionalization. Yeah. Uh, and many people blame deinstitutionalization for homelessness sure. and the problem. But the fact is, it wasn't deinstitutionalization itself. That was an appropriate thing to do because right. treatment meant that people didn't have to stay in hospital. Uh, but it was the failure to invest in the community and the failure to have the money follow the patient. Right. Right. But, you know, by the 70s and 80s, people began to realize that um, you could do stuff in the community. And across the country, uh, we had the, the uh, Mental Patients Association in Vancouver, who early on in the mid-70s, I remember visiting them early in my CMHA tenure, mm. they developed a housing and an employment program, which I brought back to CMHA Durham. Yeah. Uh, here we had on our own uh, 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 an organization uh, that you know, focused on the, the human rights of people. Yeah. And then, you know, Parkdale Activities uh, and Recreation Center found it, was founded in those days. Uh, and it, you know, did a lot of advocacy. But, you know, today it's a full service organization. Yeah. Uh, Victor Willis, who you should have in, you know, he he he's developing housing uh, in Parkdale. It's all about employment. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, they've got a uh, um, a, a, a literacy, uh, not a literacy program, but a, a writer's workshop. Yeah. So I now, think... Well, with all of this, though, I mean, the the talk to me about the voice of the person with lived experience, of the patient, of the around the same time of deinstitutionalization, uh, deinstitutionalization, the consumer survivor movement, or the or if it's the same thing as the anti-psychiatry movement, I don't know. They, they all seem to be bubbling around the same time, the human rights yeah, movement. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it began, but it didn't really take on... If, until I'd say the early 90s. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, like there. I mean, there were people like Dr. Dan Fisher, who a psychiatrist who um, leads the National Empowerment Council in right. the states, and he talks about how his hospitalization mm. uh, led him to become an advocate. And he, you know, he, and again, he's a recovery story. You know, sure. he, he, he went got a degree in medicine, got a degree in psychiatry, and still today is one of the leading lights around um, consumer voice. Right. Uh, people like Mary O'Hagan, who was a, a mental health commissioner in New Zealand. You know, in, this, in the 90s, people began to pay attention to what they were saying. Mm. And I think there were organizations like CMHA, uh, and even, you know, when CAMH got founded uh, in, in the late 90s, recognizing that you need to have not only the quote, the patient at the center, but you have mm. to give them voice. So right. one of CAMH's first initiatives was to fund separately the Empowerment Council. Right. Um, so I think it, it, it gathered steam. Mm -hmm. I, but I think we've still got a ways to go. Um, yeah. Well, it seems like in some ways the pendulum is swinging in the other direction now. It seems to be from an outsider's view, although I, I, I try to keep my finger on the pulse of most areas of the mental health system, that we're swinging back toward institu institutionalization, back toward the hardline biomedical model. Um, and it seems to be less about the social determinants of health now, even though we have more evidence than ever uh, to support that that's effective. Is that just a, a, a perception of the conversation or is that actually happening? What do you see happening on the ground? I, I think um, there, you know, I think there are concerns, and, and we've seen it recently in the media about you know people who are NCR and whether the treatment system works. Right, and, not criminally and, responsible. Uh, yeah, not yeah. criminally responsible. Um, and again, that that's a real success story because you know, according to Dr. Sandy Simpson's uh, study of uh, like twenty five years of murders in Ontario, like people with mental illness commit. 3% of the murders right. and, and um, Dr. Crocker's work uh, in, in Montreal shows that the recidivism rate amongst people who have been found not criminally responsible is about 3%. Mm -hmm. But there is a focus on, well, are we providing the right treatment, uh, whether there's risk or not? Right. Um, and there's a there's a real desire, I think, a bloodlust in some ways to punish people yeah, instead of rehabilitate yeah, them, yeah. despite the fact that rehabilitating uh, protects the public more than yeah. punishment does. Well, and the fact is that most people, I mean, if you look start to look at the data around the evidence-based services that we've, we've all been running collectively, so, uh, you know, 
uh, if you get supportive housing, um, my research director, Frank Siritich, did a study a number of years ago, which had an N of 2000, which showed that if you got case management and supportive housing, you had a really low chance of re returning to hospital. Mm. Our housing first program um, had a rehospitalization rate, uh, if you had a substance abuse issue, of 1%. Uh, and if you, uh, sorry, if you had a mental health issue, if you had a substance abuse issue, it was 3%. That compares to 12% and 16% in the Lynn. Mm -hmm. We now have in Scarborough a stepped care program uh, where uh, in the last quarter, 98% of our complex clients um, who were getting treatment in the community with a strong psychosocial focus, 98% didn't even go to hospital for any reason. Right. And over 80% uh, every year are, are never hospitalized compared with 50 days in hospital a year right. prior to coming on to a team like that. So I think what I'd say is that there, that we actually know that community treatment and multidisciplinary teams work. Right. And I think it is important to be able to balance both the psychosocial as well as the, the biomedical approach yeah. in the community. I think there's also a, you know strong support that... Um, uh, the the uh, approaches like peer support work. Uh, you know, a, a good example, though, is um, uh, Dr. Phil Klassen from Ontario Shores is trying to get people to implement the uh, Health Quality Ontario schizophrenia standards. And he's mm. identified four key things that he says, you know, basically bring home the bacon. Mm. One is uh, injectable medication. So injectable medication apparently adds... Uh, eight years of life to uh, people who traditionally would die 25 to 30 years earlier. Right. Uh, because and, of compliance to yeah, medication. Yeah. And, and, I, and also, I think you can titrate the dose and okay. you can do your medication monitoring. Anyway, his argument is that's one of the factors. Hmm. A secondary factor is actually uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for people with psychosis. Right. Uh, that's that's surprisingly controversial because people think that you have to just medicate it, that you yeah. can't train. But, but in fact, this is the evidence yeah. that if you do CBT for people with psychosis, they will thrive. Right. Sure. Uh, you know, and that gets to the other, you know, part of this uh, conundrum, which is um, there is now a movement worldwide uh, called, you know, uh, Thrive, um, and there's mental, the, the, the Thrive London, Thrive New York City, mm -hmm. Toronto has a Thrive initiative uh, led by the Wellesley Institute and CAMH, and CMHA was involved on the ground floor there. And this is a notion about population mental health. Yeah. This is that we, um, we can strive to make sure that m mental well-being is a feature of our communities. Right. And yeah, that, that, are, that our societies yeah, aren't yeah, mentally yeah, ill, yeah. so and, to speak. And that comes from, you know, what's been referred to as the dual continuum model of mental illness. Mm -hmm. And that says, you know, there are two conditions for all of us. One is thriving, one is languishing. Mm -hmm. And you can thrive with or without a mental illness, and you can languish with or without a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so that suggests that at the community level, you have to make sure that people can get access to the kinds of services they need that are evidence-based, that sure. do make a difference. But you also have to create social structures uh, that you know, support mental health, right. Right? Like, for, for, like mental health in the workplace, right. promoting mental health literacy. Well, there's, I just saw in the news, I think last week, that rates of mental illness in, uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think, I've never shied away from being controversial before, but uh, in uh, Trump's concentration camps at the border, uh, rates of mental illness are quite high. And that made me think, oh, you know, it's not a coincidence that all these people have the same broken brain, that there's something wrong with that situation. It's a very abnormal situation uh, that's causing these kinds of stressors for people. And I think that's an extreme version of what people are dealing with in terms of their isolation and the abuse that they're facing every day, even in yeah. downtown Toronto or downtown New York or London. But if we can focus on some of those those pieces better, you're saying that we can help them. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's... You know, doing work in the school system. I, right. I, I was blown away when we visited Thrive New York. They have a project in the school system uh, where they did microfinancing with homeless youth. Mm. Um, and they basically said to the kids, tell us what would make a difference in your life. Right. Uh, and some of the kids said, well, like, we'd actually like to have a recording studio where we could, you know, generate our own uh, creative stuff. Uh, 
some kids just ask for a quiet room right because life is really tumultuous on the streets yeah but that there's an interesting um, uh, message there and it's you know trust people don't right. pathologize them right. these young homeless youth some of whom many of whom probably had experienced trauma uh, had probably substance abuse problems and mental health issues but if you ask them what do you need uh, th they could tell you, you know, how they either wanted creative space right. or they wanted safe space. And and I think that's a really important lesson that yeah. we all, um, you know, can uh, experience uh, mental health issues in our lifetime. Um, you know, the, the Mental Health Commission has sort of, through its uh, the work it's done making the case for investment, uh, ha has some really interesting data. And it changes it from a those people to an mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, the, the statistic used to be one in five people in a lifetime will experience mental illness. It's now one in five people annually will experience a diagnosable mental health, uh, health or substance abuse issue. Uh, by the time we reach age 40, and I don't think you're there yet, but... Uh, Not quite. <laughs> but uh, it's one in two of us. Mm -hmm. And now with the longer lifespan, by the time we reach 70, uh, by the time we reach 90, 70% 70 of us will yeah. experience that you know, some kind of mental health. Well, issues. and I will say, although I'm not 40 yet in that one and two, I already beat that race long ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I got there already. But I think what that begins to say when you start conceptualizing right. uh, mental health is, you know, even if you go with the one in five, the one in five have family and friends who are affected sure. by how they're living. Right? Well, and especially if uh, another th the stat, I think, from that report as well, that 70 percent of people who of adults who report a mental illness uh, reported that it began as a child or an adolescent. Yeah. yeah. Right. So then you have their parents and their school, their teachers, all, yeah. everybody. in their So network. it's really about us, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, there's I mean, there's paradox in, in the figures you cited about the, the Trump concentration camps, leaving aside, you know, uh, whether a sociopath is running that country or not. Uh, um, but um, not to diagnose or yeah, anything. I mean. yeah. Well, I can't. You <laughs> no, know. you can't. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh, but 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 uh, but I think the the interesting thing is that actually there's tremendous resilience in mm. Uh, in people, even if they've experienced trauma. The work that Dr. Cram McKenzie has done uh, for the Mental Health Commission uh, showed that actually, and he did a, a meta, a meta a, uh, an analysis of um, systemic reviews. And basically, you know, only 20% of refugees uh, mm -hmm. actually experience serious mental health issues. Right. Um, now that isn't to say that even that immigrants don't experience issues. Um, uh, Quam did some work when he was in the UK around uh, the diagnosis of depression uh, in uh, Southeast Asian communities mm -hmm. and found that most family physicians missed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and but what what was that? Well, that was about your families in Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, uh, and you're in London. Right. Um, you know, you're lonely. Yeah. Um, sure. You know. Uh, so I think this notion of, you know, again, back to the dual continuum model of but what does it take to make us thrive, right, whether we have an right. illness or not? And especially in urban centers where these thrive initiatives are happening, Toronto, yeah. uh, New York, London, elsewhere. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in Toronto now for about seven years. I lived in Chicago before that. But I found that cities are often lonelier uh, right. than living out in the country in, in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, where I grew up, where everybody knows your business, for better or worse. But um, So then is, is part of that solution connectedness, bringing people together in more meaningful ways? A absolutely. And in fact, one of the things that uh, uh, Thrive New York City has is, is a thing called the Friendship Bench. Mm. Interesting story about the Friendship Bench. It was... Uh, a Grand Challenges Canada funded project that created, uh, that built benches that they set up in African villages mm. where elders would sit and young people would sit and they'd be brought together to have conversations about their lives. Mm -hmm. And so New York somehow found out about this Friendship Branch project and decided, wouldn't this be a great way to mobilize uh, people with lived experience. And so they have 40 of these benches on trucks that they move around the city. <laughs> and people with lived experience set up the benches in different neighborhoods. Yeah. And they also have in back of them a very robust crisis intervention system. And they set themselves up in neighborhoods with a sign, if you want to talk, I'm here. Right. And people come. 
Yeah. And it's all about that connectedness. And yeah. some people just talk about, well, I'm a bit lonely. Some people may just show up for information. Yeah. And some people may be in crisis. But it's had a really uh, strong impact on the community. And again, it doesn't pathologize right. mental distress. It's well, this is it. And, and I think critics of that kind of approach or, or uh, education-based approaches like mental health first aid or, or applied suicide intervention skills training, critics of that like to say that it's not medical enough or that it doesn't have evidence uh, or it doesn't have the kind of evidence that they're looking for. Yeah. So how do, we, how do we actually show that efficacy uh, that, that uh, installing a bench is working? Well, I mean, you know, the, the the problem, I think, is that the, the scientific method goes from, you know, systemic reviews to uh, randomized controls. And these kinds of, you know, uh, uh, these kind of studies uh, are, are difficult to replicate right. from a health promotion perspective. Right. So it's, it's using a different, using but, the wrong language. But I think what you can do is you can use qualitative research methods right. about what do people say they experience? Mm -hmm. Does it give them... Uh, a, a feeling of I'm feeling better about myself. Right. I'm feeling less lonely. And then, of course, what you'd probably want to do if they were willing to do it is, is say, like, what are those effects over time? Those things are kind of low cost initiatives. Sure. And it's not an either or thing. It's both and. It's like, I mean, we know, and I remember when CMHA got into the provision of ACT teams around the turn of the century. Uh, and many of my community mental health colleagues thought, well, like you guys are moving towards the medical model. Hmm. Well, okay, can you talk about what an ACT team is? So an assert uh, ACT team is an assertive community treatment team that is basically, it began, uh, the concept was the, the hospital without walls in the community. Right. So that people would have the services they need, including psychiatry, including nursing, including occupational therapy. Uh, now there's peer support built in, mm -hmm. uh, case management. Uh, so it, it focuses around people and their needs. Right. And, you know, not to say that, you know, if you have a serious mental illness and you need to take medication that there won't be side effects. There are side effects to every medication. But again, those things can be monitored. Yeah. In, mo in fact, in many ways, I mean, the the result that you're looking for is a side effect. Feeling yeah. happier is a side effect. Yeah. Feeling more effective is a side effect. And, and I think that's where in the ACT team, you know, you have it's this – integrated model of um, the psychosocial, the peer support, mm -hmm. the empowerment, along with the science of psychiatry. Yeah. And the results are phenomenal. I mean, we, we did a study of all the Ontario ACT teams um, in the mid-2000s where, on average, people would experience 50 days of hospitalization every year. And then after six years on an ACT team, there was an 82% drop in hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. So you were down to an average of 10 days mm -hmm. across the group. And, you know, uh, so you, that's quite dramatic where people yeah. aren't returning to hospital. And that makes a pretty convincing economic case. For yeah, well, we, found, well. we did the calculation based on the figures that were available at the time. And for every team you put in place, there was a net savings in reduced hospitalizations of $1.3 million. Right, right. So, you know, so, and again, this is the kind of stuff, um, multidisciplinary mental health yeah. care, uh, I would argue, uh, along with uh, the, 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 the things that are now available through the internet are the real game changers. Yeah, and I think we've, we're increasingly, especially lately, getting more data on this, although there's still a, a, a pretty shocking lack of data in mental health care in particular uh, versus the rest of the healthcare system, it seems. There, everything else in wait times, for example, are that's all measured pretty meticulously in the rest of the healthcare system, not so much so for mental health care. Well, you know, I think it's more that we don't use the data we have as effectively right. as we could. Right. I mean, so for example, uh, Kai Hai just published uh, Canadian Institute on Health Information uh, the chart book that they called, which mm -hmm. which actually looks at um, admissions to hospital for mental health conditions mm -hmm. across the country by condition, by age. And it's very instructive about, you know, what is causing people to go to hospital and right. the profile. And so we've got that kind of data. Uh, at the community level, I mean, CMJ Toronto for the last few years has been analyzing the, the OCAN data, which uh, is basically based on Mike Slade's Camberwell assessment in, uh, instruments and, and, again, shows, as I said earlier, the characteristics of people in community mental health mm -hmm. programs as well as ability to predict 
what will lead to hospitalization. Right, right. You've got things like the at-home Chez Soi uh, Mental Health Commission study, which has a strong evidence base. Um, the early psychosis intervention um, that you know Patrick McGorry um, and others have been doing and we've been doing it here in Toronto for 20 years, there is strong evidence. The problem is we haven't done as good a job as we could mm -hmm. at saying, you know, like, here's the evidence, right. folks. And then and, implementing and, it and, and monitoring and, it. And, yeah, and that's where it's all about spread and scale. I remember uh, I had the opportunity through the CMHA National Office to meet with Jane Philpott early in her tenure, and I talked to her about the need for the health accord with dedicated right. funds. When she was Minister of when Health for Canada. When she was Minister of Health for Canada. Yeah. And this was early in, in her mandate. And what I said was, you know, the, our opportunity here is spread and scale. Mm -hmm. We've been doing for 40 years a number of things that we actually know work. Right. Uh, whether it's supportive housing, whether it's supported employment, whether it's peer support, whether it's ACT teams, whether it's early psychosis teams, whether it's uh, multidisciplinary uh, interventions in the community where you're doing stepped care, where case management mm -hmm. and ACT work together. I mean, we've done that uh, in Scarborough, and uh, and there were eight teams in the Central East Lynn that were given money to create a stepped care system. Uh, they saved 30,000 days in hospitalization mm -hmm. in two years yeah. and opened up over 300 spots for people with complex conditions. So I think our, the way ahead is to make use of the data we have right. and talk about it in relation to spread and scale. Right. And that's where, you know, um, the, the threat of, um, as well as the opportunity of these new Ontario health teams, where one would hope that they will say the mental health and addiction services that exist in the community are a resource that we should grow. Mm -hmm. That we should spread and scale that, and 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 you know how do we uh, have conversations in communities across the province that make it possible that more people won't have to, as you said earlier, right. scrounge around for services that even if they found out the service existed, they couldn't get right. in. Well, right if, now the onus is on the patient who's already right. suffering to find yeah. the help that they yeah. need. And that's where, I mean, we've had some discussions uh, in one of the health teams that we're involved in about creating much more of a stepped care capacity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and working with uh, um, colleagues around emergency uh, uh, room diversions mm -hmm. to connect people with services rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, because what we found, back to the access point example I gave uh, earlier in this talk, um, that actually short-term interventions work really well. So right. if you can connect people with services rapidly and then say, look, uh, here are some other resources you may want, and if the wheels fall off the bus, here's who to call and right. we'll help you again. Right. Early psychosis intervention is a great example yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, intervening within, is it 12 months of the first episode of psychosis? Yeah, that's what you try and do. Right. And then the results are that for you know, over 70% of that population group, uh, after two to three years, uh, people have their lives back. They're right. thriving. They're in school. Right. They're working. And that's such a countercultural message to people who think uh, schizophrenia in particular or any kind of psychosis is a death sentence, essentially, that you're just always going to have it for the rest of your life and you'll always be miserable and suffering. And that's just not always true. You might always have the disorder, sure. Yeah. Uh, but there actually is hope and healing available for a lot more people than people realize. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's where I think we need to, you know, tell the story of, um, you know, the, the recovery stories that exist all around us yeah. um, and, you know, and, 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 and do much more work around stigma busting to say, yeah, well, I mean, like you can live with diabetes, yeah. uh, you know, with some forms of cancer, you can live many, many years yeah. uh, with heart disease, you can live. Uh, so this and is you about, can actually thrive. And like you, can you, thrive. you can have the illness and thrive. It's not just a matter of slogging through a yeah. miserable <laughs> life. Right? I mean, you know, like, you know, health policy analysts have argued that the failure in Canada's health system is to recognize that um, focusing all our resources on acute care isn't particularly effective, not just for mental health, but for all conditions. Right, sure. And that po our population is going to lives with chronic disease of many sorts. Mm. So that then says if, if there is no health without mental health, it mm -hmm. forces us to think about what is it we need to do to help people who may you know, suffer from depression, may live with anxiety, may have schizophrenia, may have other disorders? 
what can we do to help them live a good life? Yeah. That's really the salient question here that we need to focus on. To bring it back down to the community level, to the individual level, are there any stories that stand out for you in your long 40-plus year career of working in community mental health that have really convinced you or reminded you that recovery is not only possible, but it's actually likely uh, when people get the help that they need? Well, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, there are people like you who I've known for many years. and, and I was and, thinking about and, the other day, 10 years, I think, now yeah, or yeah, so yeah. That, that we've known each other. You know, and you've emerged as a leader and a commentator on mental health, and, you know, starting small with, you know, your own struggle and sure. talking about that and then, you know, being the chair of the board of the uh, CMHA in the Maritimes and then, you know, on the commission and then doing some work for us in the early psychosis program and other programs and then on to CMHA National. So there's one story. But I think of people uh, like Jennifer Chambers, who leads the Empowerment Council at CAMH and who has really uh, done some amazing work around um, the, you know, the importance of policing and mental health, uh, de-escalation. I mean, she's an, a witness at inquests uh, and, and, and has a real um, uh, thoughtful, uh, well uh, worked out, this is what we should be doing around mm -hmm. de-escalation and, and, you know, and, and writes and publishes and leads the Empowerment Council along with Lucy Costa. I mean, you know, uh, and Pat Capone, who unfortunately isn't well, but, you know, Pat began this journey 40 odd years ago. I first started to work with her when I started with CMHA when uh, she was publishing The Cuckoo's Nest. And she's a, you know, a, a, a well-respected author in her own right, notwithstanding being an advocate who was on, you know, the CAMH board along with me in the early days. So, I mean, I think, you know, David Revel. I mean, David Revel um, is... Uh, uh, a politician who uh, was originally a municipal politician here in Toronto, but came out with his story of his own mental illness. He might be an interesting guy for you to mm -hmm. approach. You know, became a senior advisor to the NDP, uh, and you know, talked about his struggle with mental illness. And as uh, you know, and, and and he and Catherine Church have you know run the disability studies program at Ryerson, which focuses on the human rights aspects and. Mm -hmm. Uh, the disability rights aspects of people living with mental illness. So there are lots of stories. I think many of us know that it really is the social determinants of mental health uh, uh, that, that, that make a difference. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, do you have decent housing? Do you have a decent income? Do you have a community around you, whether it's a community of psychiatric survivors or your family or your friends and colleagues in the workplace? And we know, for example, that people with mental illness can work. And it's our job to make sure that more people have that opportunity. Yeah. Steve Lurie, longtime executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association in Toronto. Thanks for, for coming in and chatting, sharing your passion. Thanks so much, Steve. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark. All right. That's it. That's uh, Steve Lurie, executive director of the Toronto branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association. One of my uh, great friends and unknown, more than almost a decade a long mentorship uh, that he's had with me. I really look up to the to the work that Steve does, and I'm so grateful that he came on the show. I want to thank you for listening, of course, and uh, to ask you a favor uh, to head over to Apple Podcasts and to subscribe to the show. Uh, scroll down to the bottom of the the thing on your phone, the page, and uh, leave us a star rating. That would be great. You can leave us some comments in the bottom too, but definitely hit that subscribe button and. Share Share. Uh, share on social media. I'm pretty much everywhere. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, everywhere else. At Mark Hennick, most places. That's at M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K. Uh, if you don't have an iPhone or if you don't have Apple Podcasts, uh, you can find us pretty much anywhere else, too. Google, we're on Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, every cast box or whatever that other one is called, Libsyn. Uh, we're, we're just about on, well, we are on every platform. So go find us, share the show on whatever device or platform works best for you. Uh, for making all that happen, for getting this show everywhere, I, I want to thank Entertainment One, Adrian and Kimberly here, and our editor Dave for bringing it all together, uh, for bringing us to you every single week, every Monday, uh, these really deep, I think important, uh, non-superficial for a change conversations uh, about mental health, recovery, society, all the important things that I think uh, that, that we're all interested in, and, and this idea that uh, there's no such thing as normal. <laughs> there's no such thing as any one standard. 
standard version of normal. All we have is so-called normal. So thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for continuing to listen to the show. And I'll talk to you again next week. I'm Mark Hennick.